Needless, Needless. 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 Podcast. Hey, Phantomaniacs, welcome to the newest episode of the Needless Things Podcast, where we talk about toys, movies, music, and all manner of pop culture dorkery. I am your host, Phantom Troublemaker, and today we are talking about Thrawn. That's right, Grand Admiral Thrawn from the Star Wars, well, formerly just the Expanded Universe, but now the Star Wars Universe proper. As many of you may know, Grand Admiral Thrawn is my all-time favorite Star Wars villain, and a new novel came out on April the 11th, all about Thrawn's rise from nobody extra galactic alien to Grand Admiral in the Imperial Navy. And I was very excited about it because, as we all know, Thrawn has been brought into modern canon by way of the Rebels television show. But Timothy Zahn, who created Thrawn back in 1991, or at least the book that was released in 1991, Heir to the Empire, uh, which was the first post-Return of the Jedi story that was released by Lucasfilm, uh, Timothy Zahn came back to write about his character Thrawn in the new canon. It was very exciting. I read the, I burned through the book in just a couple of days, and I got in touch with our buddy Chad J. Shonk, who I would say is like when you want to talk about Batman, you go to Mike Gordon. When you want to talk about Star Wars, you go to Chad J. Shonk. And that's not to say that either one of those couldn't talk about either of the topics, or plenty of other people could as well, but when you want that definitive guy that's the guy that, like, even when you have your own opinions about things, is the guy that you're like, okay, that's a good point, or you're right, or I'll defer to you, That that's your guy. So Chad's your guy for Star Wars. And then our pal Beth V, who is a huge Star Wars fan in her own right, and who has actually interviewed... Timothy Zahn. She went to Dragon Con to interview Timothy Zahn about Grand Admiral Thrawn. And there's no greater qualification than that to be on a Thrawn cast, is there? Uh, if you want to, you can go to needlessthingssite.com, uh, look for Thrawn, and you will find Beth's interview with Timothy Zahn. Also, while you're there, you can click on the box that will take you to Amazon, and you can support Needless Things through that Amazon link. You don't have to buy the stuff that's in the box. You just click on it, and once you're in the Amazon site, like once you've gotten behind that little filter, that Needless Things filter, you can go buy whatever you want from Amazon. You can go buy the Thrawn novel. You can go buy the new Star Wars Rebels uh, action figures. Well, I say new. All that's out is Thrawn and Princess Leia. But you want Thrawn and Princess Leia. You can go buy Star Wars socks, Star Wars toilet paper, Star Wars bed sheets. You can get the best deals in all the land on Amazon. And the whole time, every single thing that you buy, Needless Things will get a little bit of a kickback to help us with production costs for the podcast and for the website. So there you go. Uh, Beth, Zahn, Thrawn, Amazon, Dragon Con. It all comes together, right? Right. All right, so what else is going on before we get to the meat of the episode, as I like to call it? What else is going on? Actually, it's not about what's going on. It's about what's not going on. I have mentioned a couple of times that I will be returning to uh, TimeGate, which is now known as Hulanta. Unfortunately, uh, scheduling has not worked out. My day job my real life has interfered with my nerd life, uh, and I sadly will not be able to bring the Dirty Dirty Con Con Game Game Show Show to Hulanta, nor will I be presenting a panel at midnight on Saturday. Uh, there are... Uh, the, the, the day job was the biggest factor, but there are a lot of factors that kind of went into this. And if you want to hear more about them, you can go to supportphantom.com and check out the patron cast that I do over there for my supporters. And that's all I'll say about that. But I unfortunately will not be at Hulanta this year. Uh, after that, I don't even know my next, uh, I, we are still pondering whether or not we're going to go to Heroes Con. Obviously, I would not be a guest there because I do not produce comic books uh, as of yet, or as far as I know. 
but we may be there just for a visit. We're going to see how that pans out. It's all about the the funding. How much is it going to cost to drive to Charlotte? How much is it going to cost to stay a night in Charlotte? How much is it going to cost to go into Heroes Con and find the awesome toy dealers there and buy a bunch of cool toys? Because as much as that's about comic books, and I love Heroes Con, like you guys, if you have not been and you are any kind of comic book fan at all, Heroes Con gets my highest recommendation, even over Dragon Con. Yes, Dragon Con is fantastic for parties. Uh, you will have a nonstop, exciting roller coaster ride of awesomeness uh, from Thursday afternoon until Monday afternoon, if you so desire. It is much more so than WrestleMania 33. Dragon Con is the ultimate thrill ride. But if you want a con that's a bunch of fun where you actually get to meet the coolest creators in all the land. Heroes Con is your place. That's where you want to go. It's in Charlotte. Uh, this year it is June, somewhere around June 20th. Obviously, in this day and age, just Google Heroes Con 2017 and you'll find it. But if, if you haven't been and you can go, you really should go. It's it's freaking phenomenal. You'll, you'll really love it. So I think intro-wise, that's about all I've got for you now. Things have been uh, really busy lately. I've been doing a lot of family stuff. Uh, if you go to needlessthingsite.com, you'll find my write-up of the NXT house show that I recently attended with my son. It was tons and tons of fun. And, like, even if you're not huge on the wrestling, I think you might enjoy the write-up. And I will possibly be posting a sort of review of the Anthrax show. I had I had two big nights in a row last week, which is – why my time has been, well, my time is always precious. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but last week was a big week because I'm working nights and then my two nights off, I had things going on. First, uh, went and saw Anthrax with our pals Ryan Gataver and Gataver? Gataver. That's a new one, huh? With our pal, with our pals Ryan Cadaver and Nicole Gould, which I mentioned on last week's Curl Cast. Uh, and then NXT, was uh, that happened after I recorded the intro for last week's podcast, and it was just phenomenal. It's one of the best times I've ever had at a wrestling show. Uh, my son, even though he's not a huge wrestling fan, got really into the show because those house shows are kind. They're they're not playing for TV; they're playing for the live audience, and it's it's a totally different vibe. And we loved it. We had the best time. So I I am all peppy and full of energy. And ready to uh, go ahead and dive into the meat of today's episode, and that is an examination of not only the new novel about Thrawn, but uh, his past as well. We, we talk a little bit about his origins in the expanded universe, some of the things that have been done with him over the years, and some of the differences between his presentation in 2017 and his presentation in uh, the early 90s and, and since. So it's it's a great time. We had a lot of fun talking about this. There are spoilers about the new book, so be aware of that. If you want to go into it fresh with no idea of what happens in it, then maybe go ahead and read the book. Go to NeedlessThingsSite.com and buy the book, uh, and then come back to us. But, but I will say this. Uh, it, it is, it's about his exactly what I said, how he ascends to the rank of Grand Admiral. Uh, w within the Imperial Navy. So you guys are going to have a blast listening to this thing. I'm really excited that not only was I able to get Beth and Chad on the show, but that we, you know, we were all able to finish the book in a timely manner and get this thing out uh, in, in, in what I felt was a good proximity to the release of the book. So maybe if you don't care about spoilers, but you haven't read the book, but you're curious about it, maybe this will be a great thing for you to listen to. And regardless, we have a lot of fun talking about it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And now here is uh, not the mystery men, but something called Thrawn's Web, which is his official theme from the Rebels television show. Enjoy.
It is time to talk some Thrawn, or for the uh, more well-versed, Mithra Nuruodo, which does not come easily to those of us that speak basic, which is why he lets people call him Thrawn. I was not going to attempt it. (laughs) I did, because I like to do silly stuff on my show. And uh, we can't do a Star Wars show without our pals Chad Shonk from the left coast. What's happening? Hanging in there. Hanging in. And from, <laughs> and from uh, a little closer to home, Beth, welcome back. Hi, I'm more enthusiastic than Chad is. Yay! Wow, Yay. That's a, you're turning the tables tonight. <laughs> uh, I'll get so there. i got to ramp up. <laughs> what what we did is, is last week, uh, the new novel by Timothy Zahn, Thrawn, was released, and we were all three very eager for it, so eager that it turned out we all picked it up and all finished reading it in time to do an episode about not just the novel, but uh, just about Thrawn in general. And we're going to run down our history of Thrawn prior to his appearance in modern canon. And then we're going to sit down and kind of break down the, the book. So there will be spoilers if you've not read the book. Uh, you may want to do that and then check back in with us. But the first little portion of it here is going to be us talking about... Uh, and, and I think we've covered fairly well on the podcast before the Thrawn trilogy, uh, but we're going to talk about it a little bit more here. And I want to start with Chad because we, uh, well, all three of us, I think, to a certain extent, the expanded universe became our Star Wars home because for a very long time that's all there was. And And for me personally, in a lot of ways, I had more attachment to the books and the comic books than I did the movies for for a while. Uh, what were your when Heir to the Empire came out and this character of Thrawn was introduced? Did you have a feeling that he was going to be as special and enduring as he turned out to be? Um, we talked about we did it was almost exactly a year ago. It was April um, when we did our like two hour kind of just us plowing through our love of Star Wars. And um, one thing we did talk about was Heir to the Empire. And, I mean, that book that book saved Star Wars. It was part of what saved Star Wars and brought it from the brink of just being something where, you know, guys at conventions were going to dig. You know, it brought it, it created the expanded universe. And Thrawn was obviously the character created by that. I would say not the character that had the widest had the, the the farthest reaching effect. I would say Mara Jade probably had a bigger effect on the whole saga mm-hmm. than Thrawn did. Yes. Um, but he was definitely a, a, a great character. Um, he was very. Uh, he was a new Vader, but could not be a, and it could not have been any more different than Vader. Which and, was definitely the point of Thrawn. Yeah, he was supposed to be, you know, the anti-Vader. He was, he wasn't about emotion. He was cold. He was calculated. Um, and, uh, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's impossible to predict at the time. I was just so excited that there was a new Star Wars book and that it was telling stories after Return of the Jedi in a, in, in, in a, in a world where at that point we were pretty much told we were never going to get anything. You yeah, know, Lucas was never going to make any more movies. We were never going to get anything more. And so when that book came out, it was a big deal. And, and you know, I mean, he's the villain of that book. That book still, you know, each each trilogy era has three core heroes. Um, and uh, and this book's the heir to the empire, the the Thrawn trilogy, still stars Luke, Leia, and Han. They're still the stars of it. Um, but I thought he was a very effective villain, and I it wasn't until a long time later that I realized that he had become kind of a, a Star Wars geek kind of pet favorite character because um, Zahn wrote the three books, and then he wrote basically three more books kind of about him. Yeah. Um, one book that had him and two books about people thinking he was – Still alive two, or something. Two books yeah. about his influence. It really his influence, yeah, and then another book set in the past. And um, so it wasn't – honestly, I mean, you told me, I think, you told me that he was your favorite 
EU character, maybe your favorite Star Wars villain. He, he and, is my uh, favorite villain from Star Wars. Yeah, and um, and that's when I, you know, so yeah, I mean, I, I've always liked the character, but I haven't been as obsessed with him as definitely as Timothy Zahn has. I mean, he he made his he made his name rhyme with his name, which <laughs> I've always found it's it's like it's all well and good from his point, but like when we're discussing it, every once in a while we're gonna sound like we're talking Shakespeare when we discuss Zon, what Zon did with Thrawn. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah. So no, I mean you, you can never predict that he's gonna be that big of a character, and I definitely did not predict that he would come back as he has. So no, I mean we we had our discussion about what aspects of the expanded universe might return. And I don't think any of us thought that Thrawn w- was even a possibility among those. Uh, Beth, wh- what were your, you know, where are you on the Thrawn spectrum? Meh to he's awesome. I, I agree. I, I think he actually is my favorite villain as well. I, I find him much more threatening than Darth Vader because he is so much colder and more calculating. And, and even what they're doing with him in Rebels, he just sits back and, and lets his plans unfold and, and as he does in the new book and in the original Thrawn trilogy, he just waits for things to play out. And he always has this huge, long-reaching plan, which is much further long-reaching than anything Vader could ever come up with. Yeah, he's, he's I, always many steps ahead uh, of everyone else, even even the people that are working with him. And he knows exactly what everyone is going to do every single time. Yeah, he's... Uh, and I feel like, you know, as much as it is almost a superpower uh, the way that his uh, strategic planning is depicted. Uh, I feel like Zahn justifies it enough that your suspension of disbelief isn't bent too far out of shape. He's Sherlock Holmes Holmes meets Alexander the Great. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And and it's done well enough that it works. It never feels like, oh, he couldn't possibly do that. Because you you buy into it, but of course, if you're reading Star Wars books anyway, you're going to buy into a certain level of disbelief. Sure. sure. Well, and he also has uh, sort of the the crutch of his exotic species uh, being a chiss to to prop and, and that up as a little far bit. As, as far as I know, he's the only one we ever meet, unless there's more books about chiss. Oh that no, I don't there's know. there's plenty more chiss out there. Yeah. You you gotta you gotta dip further into the EU, sweetheart. New Jedi Order era stuff, yeah. right? Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I read the Jedi. I read the Thrawn books. I read the Jedi Academy. That's about as yeah, far as no. I got. We're talking like thirty years later. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, they they eventually uh, do some stuff with the Chiss ascendancy because uh, it's and and this is one of the things that's interesting about the new novel, and we'll get to this. Uh, Thrawn's people out in the uh, unknown unknown regions it just fell yep. out of my head if that's actually what they're called. Uh, they're aware of the Yuuzhan Vong threat long, long, long before anybody in the galaxy proper is, and that's that's part of yeah. the that becomes part of the whole story. It's kind of retconned mm-hmm. into being the story, but yep. m- me well, being I- the fan of the Yuuzhan Vong that I am. Uh, I'm okay with all of that. Lots of people uh, diverge on that one. I, I read uh, the Alan Dean Foster books. I read some Kevin J. Anderson books, but clearly I have not delved as deeply into the EU as you guys have. Well, and that's okay because, like I said, opinions vary greatly on the New Jedi Order stuff and beyond. And I, I love the New Jedi Order, but some books are better than others. We'll just say that. That is most definitely. <laughs> Chuck Wendig. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah. So originally Thrawn was brought in as, you know, I, I don't think even Timothy Zahn really necessarily had a clue that, that it would be, that he would turn out to be such an, a beloved character and such a great villain. I mean, obviously he wrote him to be a great villain, but, you know, I can't imagine he had plans beyond that trilogy given the ending of that trilogy, you know, he if he'd known the guy was going to be so hot, he might not have killed him. Well, uh, this is something that Star Wars authors do a lot, and not just Star Wars authors, but authors that do licensed material, is that 
you'll notice in, uh, but I notice it mostly in Star Wars that once someone has a character that's like even mildly mildly interesting or mildly popular in one of their books that they've created every book that they write from then on out will mention them or have them no matter how much they have to stretch sure to get sure. them in the story it's like you know i created this character so every book i have is going to at least bring them in somehow um and it's it's their way of carving out their little niche yeah yeah absolutely um, expanding in the, your in the, legacy yeah, and, and really making it long ranging. I mean, Thrawn was obviously created to be a um, a replacement for Vader and the Emperor um, because it's it takes place, you know, the Heir to the Empire takes place five years after Return of the Jedi, and and so yeah, he was designed to be that guy. Uh, I think that the story isn't as good if he doesn't fall because I, I like his how he falls. I agree, but. But the, um, you know, but the, the kind of the, the repercussions, I mean, what's so fascinating about the novel is that, you know, he's allowed to keep a lot of the things about him, but so much of it's different. I mean, he's had to abandon his original idea for the character, timeline-wise at least, altogether, right? I mean, it's a completely different timeline. Um, well, and, it's, uh, but, is it though, because, and, and I've got to think back, I didn't refresh as much as I should have, yeah. because I really, I, I I wanted to mostly discuss the new novel, but yeah, cool. we, you know, we have to, to discuss his background as well. But, I mean, he originally, the outbound flight was, yes. you know, he was around before, but he got sent back out. Like, he was rediscovered. Yes. He returned to the galaxy those five years after, uh, the Battle of Endor. Well, but he was already, but he had, outbound flight, he had run into the Republic, um, when he was still with the Ascendancy. Right. And then, uh, years later, he does join the Empire and rises to the rank of Grand Admiral, and he's still Grand, he's Grand Admiral when he goes to the Unknown Regions. Yes. Um, in the original version. And he is, the reason he does not fight the Rebellion, the reason he's not there in the books and, and, I mean, in the movies or anything like that, in, Zahn's timeline is that he is gone, right? right? That he's he's far away. He wasn't there when the Death Star blew up. Right. He's not and in, in the, the galaxy. He's off on preparing for Yuzan Vong for, business. Right, for the invasion. So in this new timeline, he is, uh, as we've seen on Star Wars Rebels, he is there during the... The rebellion. Correct. Correct. Right? So, like, and so that's a completely wise, different timeline. For time him. wise, things happened about the same, but his involvement in the conflict between the Alliance and the Empire is now different. And I believe his rise to um, power comes faster in this. I would agree with that. And I would, I would say, in the new novel, I would, I would almost say he's younger than he was in the originals. And, and it's interesting like. because it, it wasn't ever nailed down because that was one of the very, very early into... Uh, there's an Amber Alert for our listeners that I think... Maybe yeah, I just got one got. too. <laughs> um, but uh, it was interesting. I noticed early on in Thrawn that it's very clear to me that Vanto, uh, which uh, Eli Vanto, which by the way... Are they toning the name wackiness down just a little bit? A little bit. I just think. a tad. Not a ton. Yes. But like oh. Eli Vanto, Arenda Price, like Price. Well, her and, first name, her first name's a little bit of a mouthful. Her first name's pretty um, Star Warsy, but like Price and Eli yeah. are not names I would have expected in the old continuity. I think we hit a, we hit a level when we got to Dexter Jetzer, right? <laughs> and like. <laughs> Where Lucas was like just throwing, his, yeah. you know, hey, yeah, telling yeah. his kids like, hey, make a funny noise and I'll make a name. I think they, you know, the best Star Wars names, at least for heroes, are single syllable ones. A lot of them. Yeah. Um, if you look at all the, you know, Han, Luke, Leia, Ray, Finn, Poe, or you know, it's yeah, like they're keep it that, that kind of yes, very, very, very kind of uh, simple. So yeah, no, Eli. I was, but it's kind of weird that I was put off by the fact that there's a new character named Eli. Yeah, um, I, I wasn't it just crazy. Felt so, I, I wasn't crazy you know. about Eli at first, but, uh. But, but Luke's a real name. I mean, it, sure. you know, it, you know, so. Um, 
But it, it seemed very clear to me that Eli, because they were explaining where he was in his education, he's, when this novel starts, probably around 18 uh, to, to 22, somewhere in there. And yeah. Thrawn's older, but not by much, I don't think. I don't, yeah, I don't get the feeling he's a lot older. Mm, because no, not they, a lot. they wanted no. to establish, and I, one, one of the... One of the things I loved about this, and one of the key parts of Thrawn mythology, and honestly, somebody that went on to be a much more important part of the expanded universe than even Thrawn was, was Gilad Pelion. Pelion, yeah. Uh, who was Thrawn's uh, protege, basically. He didn't start out wanting to be that, but that's what ended up happening. He was his executive officer. Yes, but right. he yeah. he ended up... In a way, supplanting Thrawn in the narrative, he 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 took on the, you know, he was never as good a tactician as Thrawn, but he had his own way and and was a brilliant commander in his own right. Uh, and I yeah. feel like I, I always loved the story of Thrawn kind of slyly teaching Pelion, and I feel like Vanto was the stand-in for Pelion in this in a way because you mean you mean John Watson yes uh, yes but he's not sly about it at all no no not he's in very this one. clearly and very yes. obviously teaching well clearly to the reader uh not that you know I like that it takes a while for Vanto to kind of fully realize what's going on like oh he's grooming me for command uh yeah he's training me to think the way that he thinks and I, I really love that relationship because it was, you know, as as we were talking about, it, I think it was right before the show. Thrawn is not even the secondary character in this book. We are getting the story mainly through the eyes of Eli Vanto, Vanto Vanto. What do you got? Take a vote here. Vanto. Vanto. You know what? Uh, what? Why not Vanto? Because that goes with Zon, Thrawn, and Vanto. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> now I it mean, probably is Vanto just goodness. for that reason. Uh, yeah. I didn't. Anyway. I didn't get the audio book, so I don't know the real pronunciations. Uh, well, and you know, as I was reading this, I wondered like how, uh, what what it might sound like, like who was reading it. But uh, we we mainly get the story through him and through Governor Arenda Price, which I'm terrible with names uh, when I'm watching a television show. It usually takes me a full season to actually pick up any sort of supporting character names. I did not realize till the end of the book that Arenda Price was Governor Price because I I just didn't catch her name watching Rebels. Me neither. So I, I had did, but a, I I did, but I didn't care. How could you yeah, not that, well, care? That's, some, that's something to get into. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, <laughs> I'll what? save that. <laughs> Let's get into it. Let's get it because she's a, she's a critical part of the the novel. She's she half is. the novel, and I I didn't feel like okay. So I I could have used yes. I need to know why Lothal is important if I'm going into Rebels, but you know I I find Agent Callus a more compelling character than I find her. She's just a ruthless ladder climber. I don't I don't feel like she's very interesting. All it is is her clawing her way up the ladder. I, I didn't. I didn't feel like I needed to know quite so much more about her as I learned in Thrawn. Oh, I see. I thoroughly enjoyed her story because I like. You know, she starts off as a very sympathetic character, and we see her transition to who she is in Rebels, and that, to me, was a very interesting story. Now, whether or not it should have happened in Thrawn's book is something that could possibly be debated, but that's one of Timothy Zahn's devices, is jumping around from people to people and scenario to scenario. I can't I can't remember yeah. one of his books where he didn't have different groups of people that he was following throughout the book, or, or really any Star Wars book, for that matter. They, they yeah. Most of them tend to jump around like that. Uh, but I, I loved her story. And I found her character yeah, I, very interesting. And I love that. I always love seeing the good turn. It's always interesting to me when it's done well. And I felt like this was done well. I didn't find her very sympathetic at the beginning because she, she right at the beginning, seemed to hold sort of a disdain for her upbringing and for where she came from. 
But see, I took that so I, just as being a typical young person. I mean, we all want to get away from, from home. Yeah. But she valued what her family had done and was furious that it was being taken away. Like, I, I could totally relate to that. But in a very, very, very short amount of time, she really flipped. To me, that well, was that was a this, quick flip this novel, over. In, but this in novel evil. covers this novel covers like fifteen years. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I it's I, not I, quick. It's 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 well over a decade. I it, would say the, the course of this because it ends at two a b y right. It ends two yeah. years before the Battle of Yavin, which is where we're at at Rebels. Yeah, so it's, it's a long. I mean, you know, years pass between chapters. And the Empire but she starts, is very new. betraying people pretty quickly. No, she does. No, she does betray people right off the bat. Uh, I every Star Wars art author has a challenge, which is, and like I said, you have your nine core movie heroes, and then whenever they want to create a new character, they have to make us care about this new character because we're going to care about Luke and we're going to care about. Finn, but we're not going to necessarily care about your new character. Because I didn't make the connection either that it was Governor Price, because again I also did not understand her name. She didn't come <laughs> into Rebels until Season 3 either. She had been mentioned before but she didn't show up on the show until Season 3. So I didn't make that connection. And I didn't find her, I'm kind of in between you guys, I didn't find her particularly compelling. I think honestly it sounds... It's, it's a little meta, I guess. I would have been more interested in her story if I knew who she was, if I had made that connection. Right. Because to me, it was just, oh, well, here's just another character that, you know, I get, I get Eli's character. Eli is our window to Thrawn, right? He is, mm-hmm. he's, he's the, he's there as our audience surrogate to watch Thrawn. I have my own issues with their how how that story was presented, but but I I understand him. Her, I didn't get it. At first, I didn't make that connection, and so I did get at times a little bored with her story because, um, listen, I've read all sorts of Star Wars novels, but Star Wars is still an adventure movie, an adventure franchise, and there's very little adventure in this novel. There's very little action in this novel, right? And her her storyline is just flat out just talking in meetings. Well, and I, you know. but see, I liked the the things that I like about the prequels are the maneuvering and the politics and the wow, this is how this horrible status quo came to be. And to oh, so me, you like you like the Galactic Senate debates? No, I do. I genuinely yeah, do. do. I like that stuff. And I to, see. I don't. I, I do too. But I I have more stake in those characters. Well, like, but here, to me, this was a little slice of right. look at the system. Look at how dirty it is. Look at how these people operate. Like, I, I was so excited about the idea of uh, when they were talking about a, a possible live-action show that takes place on Coruscant and is about the, the underworld and the government. Yep. I was so excited about that fucking show, you guys. Like yeah. I love. No, I would that love to stuff. see that too. I I, yeah, would, I would love, love to, to see that. like the West Wing, but Star Wars. <laughs> I, I said I could have used a little less of her, but I, I again I my feelings about her storyline once she became governor of Lethal, I looked it up like while I was still reading, mm-hmm. and I said, "Oh, it's the girl <laughs> with the short black hair." Right, and then all of a sudden I started caring. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. that's it's weird to say, but like because she wasn't all of a sudden a character from scratch. Well, no, that makes that, that has totally to earn my attention. It totally right? makes sense and, though, because she had th- at that point she had an anchor like in your your soul, so to speak. Right, she's she's part of the story, and she's not just you know I've read not countless but lots of Star Wars novels um, where they introduce you to a new lead character. There was a series called. Coruscant Knights, which is supposed to be kind of a film noir detective story yeah, type thing. Yeah, and they trailer. brought in that detective. That's the one that had the completely different story of how Evan Peel died, right? Right. Yeah, and the and yes, exactly. And the and the lead character was so dull, I um, agree, and had no grounding in anything else. I didn't even finish 
couldn't finish the trip. Well, notice they, the series. Uh, yeah, notice they never went because I, I, that was supposed to be a new ongoing, and it did not. Yeah, go I on. don't. I mean, I don't remember his name, so that's you know, <laughs> right, I, need, right. I, I know most of the names, but he didn't. But even, so here's here's how dull he was. That happened during the glory days of Hasbro making almost every expanded universe character that was created. Yeah, they did not make that guy. Right. No, no, and 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 I was excited by the concept of it, but uh, of doing like a detective stories. I, you know, just like with Death Troopers, you're excited about the idea of doing a horror story. You know, in Star Wars, I, 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 I like the concept of those things. I don't think they've always been executed well. But See, I thought that first. I thought the first zombie stormtrooper novel was good. Yeah, it was uh, fun. The second it was, it was one, a lot of fun. second one, not so much, but the first one I really enjoyed. Well, the second so, one, so, I feel like the flaw was they got too deep into Star Wars mythology. Yeah, instead of just telling a, a yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. All right, but but, but back to but Thrawn. I, but, back to Thrawn. But yeah, so I I think that that once I realized who she was, it it de- definitely made me care more. Um, it didn't excuse the fact that, that I, I did find her story a little less than compelling, um, partially because even when we were in Thrawn's half of the book, most of it is through Ev- Eli's point of view, mm-hmm. and so. Every bit we were spending with her, we weren't spending with the title character. Right, right. And so if I wasn't totally engrossed in everything she was doing, then um, – uh, and again, if I had picked up right away that I it was a character from the show – I mean – but don't get me wrong. It's not a character from the show that's made a big impression on me. But <laughs> right. I mean, she's, she's fine. She's there. But she showed up the same episode Thrawn did. So, you know, who am I going to pay attention to? That's why I couldn't figure out why she got so much of the book. She was she's just kind of there. She's not like a big character in Rebels. So well, it was a spoiler. Well, yeah, but the she's book. the one. But she's the one that brings him in to track the crew of the Ghost to find the crew of the Ghost. Well, and here right? as far so, as as far as the novel goes, here's my feeling about that: is her ascent through the Empire's political system is mirroring his ascent through the Empire's military system, and yes. he. The, the, a major aspect of Thrawn's uh, character is his straightforward nature. He does not have the talent for greasing palms and saying the things that need to be said. He he got as far as he got through sheer skill and through the fact that they simply couldn't deny his results. Whereas she learned to game the system Learn to to say the right things to the right people, and yes. at the end, they had to help each other out, and that's what led, like you know, like Chad said, it's a prequel to Rebels, and that's what led to that relationship that they have. So, yeah. I mean, I think almost to his detriment that it was bound to end up in the same way that Rogue One had to end with the plans being handed to Leia. Spoilers. Right. If you're listening to this. <laughs> if you haven't if seen you've, Rogue if One. You've you you probably minutes, shouldn't be listening to this. <laughs> if you've gotten ten minutes into this <laughs> and have any idea what we're talking about, then you saw Rogue One. Yeah. So um, just the way Rogue One had to end that way, um, this it seemed like he was... I don't know if he was told to or if it was, it was his choice, but... This leads directly into the beginning of season three of Rebels. Like season three of Rebels happens the next day. Which look, it feels like I. You know. Yes, it feels a little contrived for it to work that way. But at the same time, I will take that over the uncertainty of the old continuity any day of the week. No. Yes. Yes. Because sure. yeah. we it, know. I agree. We, now, to to a small degree, there may be things here and there that the because the films will always come first, no matter what. But there is a much stronger feeling of this canon all has to work together now. And well, I, there's no longer going to expand the universe. This is just the universe, right? This is it. They have this a story. They have just, a story committee that's overseeing all of this. Exactly. So there will, you know. The, I, I, if if the movies decide like this bathroom scene in Thrawn doesn't make sense, we have to do something different for the movie. They'll do it. But right. as far as major chain of events go, this happened. This is fact. This could have been animated in part of Rebels, uh, and I yeah. love that. Yes, 
Yes. Um, I have, it, it is interesting though, if we want to talk about his character for a second, there are differences in his character from his original incarnation. Though. Yeah, let's talk about um, it. Timothy Zahn was presented with a very unique challenge. He created this character 20, God, 26 years ago or whatever, um, in, in a world where he was basically given carte blanche as far as like what has happened since Return of the Jedi, what is the universe like. I mean, uh, our impressions of like the post Return of the Jedi world come from those three books. Right? Well, they, until they Air the to the, until Heir to the Empire came out, I mean, we all thought that was it. Yeah, yeah, there was the, nothing. The rebels right, yeah. won, yay! Yeah, yeah, and that's what you're intended. To, that's what you're supposed to think. Sure. Because then you're, you know, because what you don't want to do is finish that finish Return of the Jedi with that horrible shot of them all standing around for a group photo. And um, it's my least favorite shot in Star Wars history. I don't care about any of the prequels, but the Return of the Jedi ends with them all hanging out, and posing for like a picture. It's really weird. But <laughs> they could but, have primitive cameras. You don't know. They're not posing. They're just all sitting like on. It's like they're it's sitting like, on Spanish it's steps like in Rome the, or something, just hanging like out. Ewoks are making home movies. It's like the end of an American Pie movie where they're all winking <laughs> each other while they hold yeah, up their exactly. flasks. Yeah, yeah. But it would be a real bummer if then Han goes like, "Yeah, but we still got like probably three more years of war." <laughs> <laughs> Which is the you reality. Know? But as a kid seeing that movie, you don't think that. No, of course not. You don't want to hear that. No. So the idea that they were still fighting the Empire five years later, I was I was down for that. I, I, I was into that. And um, but the one thing I did, I did do a little review of the. I didn't go back and read the Heir to the Empire novels. I've read them twice, but I didn't go back and and read them again. I did read some synopses, and I did go on. I did read. I told you I read the comic book adaptations of them. Yeah, yeah. Because um, that's a lot faster. They're not very good, but they at least gave me. And I flipped through the stuff that wasn't. I was just reading the Thrawn stuff. Um, but original Thrawn was more violent. He was more cruel than this new version. Well, and that this new was version his... avoids casualties. And, and well, and that's that's what you said earlier about the way that it ended being so effective because that that was his undoing, his his callous disregard for the Nogri. Yeah, he he's got a very, you know, I just I mean, there's a scene where in the first one where. Someone on the bridge screws up, and he hasn't murdered right yeah. there on the bridge. You know, I mean, my, you know, keep firing assholes. But it's like he just <laughs> he he he. You know, it, he's a much more violent man, a much more angry man, or being chis whatever in in the in the originals. Um, in 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 this, and I wonder if part of that is one. Timothy Zahn is now you know quarter of a dec quarter of a century older, and maybe just thinks about things differently. Sure. Or two. He's writing a book that's about a character that is now on a cartoon. And so that maybe there has to be a little bit of massaging there to not make him as, you know, to not make him as disturbing as maybe it was originally. Um, but there are... And if, you know, if the book does well, it could be the kickoff to, you know, more Thrawn books down the road where we find out more about his character development and how he turned from snuggly, well, I have... Oh, that's that's a fair point. That, that's actually yeah, yeah. a really good point because right now, when when Thrawn ends, or when Rebel, when uh, as far as we've seen him in Rebels, anyway, uh, clearly something happens to remove Thrawn from what we see in episodes four, five, and six. You haven't heard about the casting yet. They've cast Warwick Davis for season four of uh, Rebels as Rook. Oh, really? Uh, yup. See, yep, that was a big casting announcement and celebration. It's that well, I guess I guess that look. nails down one of the questions I wanted to ask was, you know, they they have I, I believe Disney announced that yes, once we get to nine, we will keep going. Uh, and and one of the things right. I wanted to bring up, do you think it's possible that we will see Thrawn live action in the movies? But if they cast Rook... Yeah, I mean, they, we don't know that's for sure. But right, for right. For people who don't know, Rook is the Thrawn's personal bodyguard who ends up stag, stabbing him in the chest with a knife to kill him. Um, it's a little weird because the Nogri have not been uh, on the show yet. Right. Um, no, no, there's no confirmation that he will be a Nogri that you know the race of assassins um but that is the character name that you know star wars royalty warwick davis will be playing so let's let's um, put that aside the voice of. 
let's yeah. put that aside. Uh, I think Rebels is going to get real bloody this season. So. Because, oh, I think you're right. Because it has to. It has to. <laughs> I think we're going to lose lots of characters. Uh, they Because at this point, you know, in, in the Thrawn novel, the new novel that we're talking about, they have once again established that the Chiss Ascendancy is aware of an extragalactic threat and that mm-hmm. that's why Thrawn made contact with the Empire. So the seeds have been sown for the Yuuzhan Vong in this I'm gonna, new continuity. I'm going to break your heart. I'm going to break your heart. Do it. It's not. That's not what it is. That's not what it is. Um, so the Aftermath trilogy, uh, written by Chuck Wendig. Oh, that thing that um, I will never read. You'll have to enlighten me then. Okay, I will. Then I will enlighten I'll, you. This spo- is not spoilers for the Aftermath trilogy. Uh, book three. Uh, the Aftermath trilogy takes place between Return of the Jedi and the Battle of Jakku, which is the last stand of the Empire. Yes. Um, uh, leading to, you know, all the ships crashing Jakku and Force Awakens. At the end of that book, um, on Jakku, actually, we find out that the Emperor has been monitoring a place in wild space where he feels a great power coming from. Right. And it's right. even mentioned, it's even mentioned in the book, that th- some of the information he has this observatory, and some of the information collected came from Thrawn. They even name check him in the book, okay, saying that that information had come from him. That is where the remnants of the Empire, after they lose Jakku, go to to rebuild. So the 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 way now they haven't explained what it is. It could be Snoke. It could be something else. It could be something else entirely. I haven't said, but. It lines up directly with the idea that um, Palpatine has been tracking this thing out there as well, mm-hmm. and he's helped Thrawn. Thrawn has helped him do it, but it is very clear at the end of the book that that is where, because it's um, Hux and his father and a couple other Imperials, and they're supposedly being waited. There's people there waiting for them, but they have been sent to this place, and it, in the the place that they're talking about is now what it is. We don't know, but it's the birth of the first order. Let me throw, the, let me, order. let me throw this at you and unbreak my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Who's to say Snoke isn't Naminor? He could be, except for, I just don't think they would do that. I just I, don't, I think don't, it, well, and the th- here's the thing. I do not want a direct adaptation of the New Jedi Order any more than I wanted a direct adaptation of Heir to the Empire and and the Thrawn trilogy. But, as with everything else, they can pick and choose elements from the expanded universe to interpret in different ways in the future narrative. And I... I, Like, there are good and bad things about the New Jedi Order, but I think they could take the good things and there's a great story to be told there. Oh, I always love the idea of a an extra galactic existential threat. I there's, always like that idea. There's stuff other than Skywalkers. It's very much like it, well, it's very much like the White Walkers on Game of Thrones. Like yes. you know, while y'all fight over the the crown, the White Walkers are coming. Yes, you know, it's not as blatant of a climate change uh, allegory <laughs> as it is on Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's, it totally is, but it is. Um, but it is that same idea that, that it, and I always liked the idea. I wasn't a fan of the execution. I thought it went on way too long. Um, you know, it was, God, what was it? it was like 20 something books. Wasn't well, it? I liked, I liked saw. the, I liked how long the war went on, but the book series itself, there were too many books. It took, it took a while. And if they so cut I out think, the ones that weren't great, it would have been perfect. Well, I mean, you bring this up and it is an interesting point though, that, what is you know you know you know I had a personal little gut punch when they said we're throwing out the expanded universe even though it was expected, but the people that are keeping it alive are not the people making the movies. The people keeping it alive are the people making Rebels and writing the comics and writing the novels yes. because they are using every opportunity to slip in things from the EU that other people created to canonize them. Dave Filoni's mission is to save as much as the EU as possible on his shows. Yes, that, that has become clear. You know, like he wants to bring, he wants to save everything he can from Black Sun to the Death Watch. You know, like, I mean, he rewrites Origins when he has to. Like, they just brought Wedge in on the latest season of Rebels and his Origins a little different than it was originally. I, I don't but, love that, but that's a different episode. 
Yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's fine. But but the 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 but the people that you know, and Gary Witta, who um writes on Rebels, who has got a story by credit on Rogue One, I think he you know, some of the stuff you know, Rogue One was a movie that as we talked about when we talked about Rogue One, felt like it was an expanded universe story mm-hmm. in, on its own. But yeah, you have these people out there that are like you know, Dave Filoni is a huge EU fan. <laughs> you know, and and so he is working in everything he can into these seasons of Rebels. I mean, there's only one more season of Rebels left, but he's working everything in that he can to um, to s- not save things, but to, like you said, to adapt things, to incorporate things. And I think that's why, I think, I mean, originally he wanted to do Thrawn on Clone Wars. And um, I think that was either rejected or they couldn't find a way to do it. Um, I gotta say, I'm glad to, they didn't. But he's been wanting to do Thrawn for a while. So, you know, so it's not a surprise if you, if you look at kind of Dave Filoni's love of the expanded universe, they would want to do that. So it is possible that they would do something like that. I can't see it being done in a movie because even though there's a lot of synergy story wise, there is still a very big break between the people making the movies and the people making everything else. Sure. sure. As far as their level of involvement in the world and the franchise. Um, you know, we talked about it before. Lawrence Kasdan does not give a shit about any of these books. Right. Right. When he's writing a Han Solo movie, he's just writing a Han Solo movie. But right? I feel and, like when he's writing his Han Solo movie, you know, he's not the only one writing it. And there are people no. involved with this, like you said, the story editor, or not story editors, um, the story council, story or whatever council, whatever, yeah, whatever they're called. Story group. Uh, yeah. That when they see opportunities, you know, oh, well, during this Han Solo movie, there's a crime syndicate that is sort of a side thing that they have to deal with. Let's just make that Black Sun. Right. No, and they they could definitely do that. And, and those are things that I think they would find fairly harmless. I just mean, story-wise, I just think you're going to get a series of people that want to tell their own original stories in the movies. And um, I'm hoping we get to the point, like Marvel, where... Marvel has started to adapt almost directly story, you know, Civil War is, right. you know, it's not exactly the same, but it is an adaptation of an actual comic. It's a, it's a streamlined it's a, interpretation. Right, but it is an adaptation in the yes. same way that Winter Soldier was an adaptation of two different comics. But yes. they've started to take the real series, you know, they're gonna do, they're gonna do the Infinity War. That was a real thing. In the, well, it wasn't a real thing, but it was in the, in the comics. <laughs> right, it right. It's so, real for you. You know, listen, I, you know, I would love a, um, Tales of the Jedi show based on the old comics, Tales of the Jedi comics. I, um, I would take any of the tales of, I, I would take a tale yeah. from the Moss Eisley Cantina Netflix you know, show, Tales but, of the Empire. Well, Tales of the Empire would be the West Wing I was talking about before. Well, one thing I did want to address real fast was because we talked a lot about Price's side. But the side of the novel that actually it didn't bother me that I but I thought was a little disappointing was actually the Thrawn and Eli side of the novel, and, okay. and I'll explain why quickly. It was very repetitive. Here's what the plot of the Thrawn novel is: Thrawn is an officer. He has his aide, Ensign Vanto. Are we decided yes. on Vanto. Um, We're going with Vanto. Vanto. And we come in on the story in a chapter, and there is a problem to be solved. Thrawn then solves the problem using his superior intellect and his his, his observational skills. Again, he's he's got he's Sherlock Holmes, and but he does it in an unorthodox way, but effective. It gets him in a little bit of trouble. He think you know Vanto is like, well, this is the end of the this is the end. He's going to get court martialed. He's going to get busted down. Whatever. But then, instead, he gets promoted for it because, one, yes, he's very good, and two, the Emperor's looking out for him. Right. Then, the next time we meet them, they're in the, and then he gets a promotion. And the next time we meet them, now Captain Thrawn has a problem in front of him, and he solves it in a clever way, but it's unorthodox, and he gets called on the carpet again, and he gets promoted again. And that happens like four times. It's very episodic. It keeps using that same... Now, I like the idea. Now, we've never seen a Thrawn who had to answer to anyone before. Mm -hmm. So that is an interesting angle, the fact that he is a little slightly anti-authoritarian 
in the sense that he he's just going to do what's best for the mission. Damn everybody else. Right. Um, you, you do it. But I felt that it got incredibly repetitive and episodic because we're jumping through the years. He just he every time we jumped into the Thrawn storyline, it was okay. Well, this is the next time he gets promoted. This is the next time he gets promoted because it was a very linear storyline of him. If him, you know, you know where it's going. He's just going to keep doing crazy things until he's Grand Admiral. <laughs> you know, and we're like, yeah, that's yeah, the destiny he's on. So it felt a little repetitious. Uh, repetitious to me. It felt a little just samey. And in the the situations were interesting, and the characters were interesting, and I love the interplay between him and Eli. Um, but every single occasion was. You done fucked up again, Thrawn. And then he comes out of the thing. He's like, eh, they made me a commander. <laughs> you know, and moving on, you know. And then the next time you meet him, he's a commander. And, oh, look, they made me a Commodore. And it just, it just, it, it, it wore on me a little bit. And, and the other thing that bothered me, and, and this does get into spoilers, is that I was very disappointed about the payoff for Eli um, at the end of the novel. That... Thrawn is grooming him the whole time. We know he's grooming him. Uh, again, it's very Dr. Watson, right? Dr. Watson, uh, you know, when he meets Holmes, doesn't know shit. But by the time they're having their adventures, Watson is almost as good at Holmes as what he's doing, right? He doesn't have that level of genius, but he's almost as good. It's the same thing with Eli in this book. And he's grooming him for something greater, and then he sends him home to join the Chiss at the end of the book. And I... That wasn't satisfying to me because that's like one of our lead characters, and maybe he's setting that up for another story. He's well, setting that up. For I another totally, book. I totally thought that was a setup for something else Let, to come. It, it could be, but in the context of this book, I was like, I was waiting for why? Are, why is Eli in the book? Well, let's let's because, go back. Let's you know, go back, Beth. Yeah, did the did the nature of Thrawn's progression? Like, did that bother you the way that it did Chad? It didn't bother me at all. I, I enjoyed it, and I was I was actually glad that it was all within one novel, because if it was a Marvel comic, it would have taken 36 fucking issues to tell the same story. <laughs> uh, how how did you feel about the, the pacing of the progression? Well, that's one of the things that bugged me about having so much Governor Price, is because if you wanted to see some Galactic Senate hearings or, or military tribunals, we, we could have totally had some chapters where we're seeing the higher-ups decide what to do with Thrawn and why. Or we could see the Emperor stepping in and, and swooping in and saving him again, but see more of that and more of the why behind it. Hell, we'll even show the Emperor talking to someone else about Thrawn and why they're doing this and what's going to happen. There, we could have cut out a whole lot of Governor Price and added <laughs> some more of that in. And I think I would have been a little bit more satisfied with the jump to situation promotion situation promotion right, situation right. promotion i i feel like the the emperor thing I, for me personally it was enough for them to have that meeting at the beginning and to know that that's what was going on like it was almost he was always there yeah it was almost fun to me for vanto to every time be like well this is it what is going on with this guy? Like, because right. once we sort of shifted to him being our, our, uh, not avatar, but you know what I mean, our, our viewpoint for the sort story. Our he's, our, he's our companion. Is, yeah, he's, he's our companion. And, yeah. and his, his sort of like, what is the deal? Is kind of like, it's a fun part of the story for me. And, and if they had had those behind closed doors meetings, uh, one that would have been a whole other story and presenting another viewpoint uh that right. that we weren't privy to uh and and, and don't get me wrong i will read that book too if they want to do, if zon wants to do that as a separate book i'll buy it like, I, right. I wouldn't have minded reading about a little more about what what the hell's grand moff tarkin doing what what are his big plans well i and i will uh, well there's a tarkin book out there you can you can read that one, and we and know I, what and we know what his big plans are. And I fi well, yeah, you're right, we do. He's oh, yeah, I mean, ball. yes, he's building a big ball. I finally got to the back half <laughs> of the Tarkin book, and it's and it's really really good. But now I want a Wolf yeah. Ularin book. I couldn't get past the first half of the Tarkin book. He spent too much time talking about what his uniform looked like. No, trust me, get to the get second there. half. The second yeah. half is awesome. Yeah. I, I like the fact that they brought in Ularin like to have a, a, a character. But I wanted to run something by you guys real fast. Yeah. 
when you when when this one thing that struck me about halfway through the book, so with the him and Vanto at the academy, and then him and Vanto getting assigned to various ships as they went along, right? It felt very Star Trek to me for a while. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I realized what Thrawn in this book was, other than being Sherlock Holmes, is he Kirk? Which he obviously is. No, <laughs> totally. he's Spock with ambition. Oh wow. If you, took, if you took Spock's abilities, but you gave him a aim, an amoral ambition, oh right? wow, that's what he felt like to me because he was the logical one, the calm yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. He had this thing, and it, I just was watching. I was going like, nah, he's like, he's like if Spock wanted to rule the Federation. Well, and what's, <laughs> what's interesting, <laughs> what you bring up, I'm absolutely delighted at the idea that the Empire is to a certain extent the Federation because the Navy is presented... I feel like the Imperial Navy was presented a little differently in this book than it ever has been. Uh, I don't know that we've had... What's fascinating me about the new canon and about these new books that are coming out is how Imperial heavy it is. Yeah, if you've seen the trailer for the new Battlefront 2 uh, video game, the um, which looks great, but the... Uh, the, the the single player campaign that everyone was complaining was not in the first Battlefront game um, is you're you're an Imperial Special Forces right. Agent. It's very oh, interesting and and when it's funny when you take Thrawn and Tarkin and the prequel to Rogue One, which I can't remember what it's called right now. Uh, Catalyst. Between those three books, you get such a rounded look at the construction of the Death Star. I feel like we're for sure in for a book about how the Death Star bathrooms were put together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is there was already a novel in the EU called Death Star. Yeah. yeah. About the, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's well trodden territory. But, but you're I right. Do... There has been a focus on villains or not villains that but, well, I think part of it is, is the attempt to not show them as villains. Yeah. And, is, and it's very you know. interesting to see like from, and it, and it goes back to one of the key ideas of the entire star Wars concept is from a certain point of view and from a yeah. certain point of view, like if you, if you went into Thrawn cold, uh, He's not a bad guy. No, he's no. There's no indication that they're bad guys. No, the, this is this is the government. This is the police yes. force. They trying... do things you don't like, just like our government yes. does. They do things that you know that 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 seem wrong that or whatever. But he's just an employee they're, of the government. They're he's, trying. He's to... kind of like Robert E. Lee a little bit too. Well, they're know, trying to maintain like, you know? order. And and yeah. if you look at it strictly from that, it's a, it's a very interesting what they're doing presenting the different points of view uh with the new canon and i and i really dig it uh all right we got yeah, interesting. we've got to uh we got to bring this thing home uh what yep. i want to do is i've got a couple of points that i wanted to nail down uh okay. chad and beth if you've got any notes that were things that you specifically wanted to bring up now is the time to do it uh beth i do have things but i'd like to point out i'm working from no notes for for once just let you know. Wow. You're I usually have like very nine, well. I usually have nine pages on my Evernote, but I don't have anything. <laughs> You're like, I never get to them all, so fuck it. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Beth, have you, were there any specific things that you wanted to address or any things that struck you uh, about the book or about Thrawn in general? So I didn't get a chance to say it, but the, the one reason I really wanted to see more of the naval politics portion of that was because they keep talking about how xenophobic – the Empire is. So why does he keep getting promoted and why do they keep moving forward with him? Yes, he gets results. And aren't they super, super xenophobic and trying to either uh, wipe well, or control not everybody? Anymore. Here's, not anymore. here's the thing. Uh, it is addressed in the book. They mention, uh, now not from the Emperor's level, but you have an established, you know, a lot of these people came from the Republic, uh, and you have this established institutional racism that they address sort of lightly in Thrawn, yeah. of these people kind of making side eyes at this blue guy with the red eyes. None of them are happy about it. Like you do. Yeah, like you do. Uh, everybody looks around before they make chiss jokes to make sure there are no chiss standing around. <laughs> 
right. but yeah, I mean, it's addressed in the book that they're, all of these old white guys with British accents are not pleased that this blue guy is getting all these promotions. I mean, they talk, but about it's it. also different. They, they from, it is they very it's, for me. But here's the the, the 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 idea of the of the the empire itself being a no aliens club is a completely expanded universe concept. It is. So that is out the window. So what basically they establish mm-hmm. in this book is it's racist like we're racist. Yes. Right? It's it, it that's what it comes out to. It's they're not, not they're not Nazis racist. anymore. They're so, right. Because we had they're a black Americans. president we can have a blue grand admiral. Yes. Well sort and, of. yes. Sort of. But also <laughs> don't forget uh, good old Sheev is pushing him through every step of the way. Yeah. There's no way he's never going to fall because Palpatine is is pushing those buttons. And I think that's made pretty clear that Palpatine, it, you know, no matter the reason no one ever touches him, right? The reason why, you know, the guy even says, he's like, I couldn't get you out of here, so I had to try to set you up to get killed near the end, right? Mm-hmm. Is because um, Night Swan or whatever... Uh, that storyline, I didn't really click with me, but it would have the, clicked with me if that had turned out to be Talon Card, and they went on from there with a relationship. Oh, that would have been awesome. Yeah, if it would have been somebody. I mean, but but I think what this book does establish is the um legal, like the actual like legal racism that was part of the old idea of the empire is gone. Yes, and now it's more just an institutional, just like. Real life racism. Well, and as, hair, as soon as Phantom Menace came out, the old expanded universe racism made no sense because Palpatine's right hand man was I can't remember what race uh, Darth Maul right. is, but a cab. Right? Yeah, he's a cab. Yeah, I mean they uh, Zabrak. Yeah, they always had Zabrak. Right. Palpatine was always willing to use aliens for his own means. He though cared about results. He cared about results, but the propaganda of the empire was – well, this is really getting topical today. But the propaganda <laughs> of the empire was um, was severely racist. But that – again, that is a – that is an EU concept, um, and this is the first book to address it. And I think what Zahn did was pick something in the middle. It's he, not well, the Federation. He made, it, he made it more reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Federation, but it's not the Nazis. You know, yeah, it's well, – and- Good old straight up racism. Well, and this like- also directly addressed for the first time the Empire's use of slaves. No, they've talked about that before. Have like, they? I mean, yeah. well, I mean, the second book of Aftermath is all about the oh, liberation. Oh, well, okay, of yeah, and I apologize. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I'm saying, no, I'm just saying, no, it's fine. So it's all about the liberation of Kashyyyk. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. Uh, I believe they mention in Catalyst, they do talk about the the slave labor they use to build it, you know, because oh, there's a lot of right, because what the... he's doing is he's he's finding the Death Star, right? right One of the things right. Thrawn is doing in this novel is discovering the Death Star by figuring out where's all this material going, where were these Wookiee slaves going? Which I love right? because like that he's... gave him a dimension of not it it continued the thread that he wasn't just doing this to be a good Imperial guy. That yes, you know, I'd like I need to get to an know, alternative to your motive. Right. Yeah. Is he building something that I can use or is he building something that's going to be a threat to my people? Yes. Yeah. So um yeah. Uh I didn't have like I said, I think we covered almost everything. I, I was intrigued, like I said, as a as well, a I writer. Think Beth, had, Beth, did you have one more? Oh I'm sorry. No, I, I, I did it's okay. I hey, I'm used to Chad. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing was more of a question I wanted to pose to you guys because I spent most of the book waiting for Vanto to be betrayed. I was waiting for Thrawn to sell him out, shoot him in the back. Oh, really? Sub him off a planet, do something to him. I really, really expected him to get betrayed because I kept expecting, There's, where's the Thrawn that I know? Because the Thrawn that I know has got to be in there somewhere. No, see, I... I, Him over. I didn't see that at all because I, I from the start, felt like Vanto was the new Pelion. They also present in this, and, and in, on Rebels, and we didn't talk about Rebels enough, but he, he definitely, this is a kinder, gentler Thrawn than was originally conceived. That's I, I don't think I, there's any way around that. Um, I and got so, it, but I just, I just 
you know. No, I know you wanted fun. a twist, and that's why, like I said, that's why I was disappointed in where Vanto ended up because it wasn't super dramatic. You know, it wasn't, you know, and it didn't turn out. And Vanto changed his name to Admiral Mahdi, yeah, you know, right, or like, you know, right, something, right. something to like tie it in in the way that Price ties in well, to Rebels. Well, like, like Beth said, the, or I can't remember which one of you said it, like whichever one of you said it, I think there's another book coming out of that. I think there, Zahn was, was sowing the seeds to get paid again. Oh no, mo- most definitely there's, there's more out there for it. Um, but no, I didn't expect the betrayal. I, I thought that the just said that they were presenting, and, and you know, and the one thing I wanted to bring up was just they said we hadn't hit rebels that much. But the the idea that you know on rebels he is also this very it's kind of weird because it's kind of like Zahn created this character, but he kind of had to then sculpt the character to match the character that was being written on Rebels, which yeah. was not written by him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's a very, as a writer, it's a very weird predicament to be in, to take your character and almost completely reimagine, reimagining his context, but trying to keep the character intact. Um, I did like the fact that, you know, he was able to keep in things like the Chimera as his flagship. Yes. And, and little things like that that don't make waves. You know, they keep the continuity, but they don't make any kind of waves. Um, we're never going to see Mara Jade, ever. No, I think again. you're right about that. Um, you know, we'll probably never see Paleon again. Paleon, although, you know, he could throw him in there as just some guy somewhere. But I, I don't want to see, see him Jade. unless he's going to be the, the you know, the Paleon we knew. And, and I want to see, you know, but I, you mentioned Talon Card. That would be a great character for them to resurrect in any context. You Absolutely. Know, it doesn't have to be in, in this context. And he'd be very but flexible. I, they could do a lot of different things with him, and it would still ring true. But at the end of the day, like, I was, I enjoyed the novel. I was a little let down by it only because I wanted a little more of a ride um, and a little more, a little less of a an accounting of what happened and more drama. In a I way, understand. It, I understand. It felt very much like a checklist of um, this is how he came to power, and uh, there was only one through line through his story, which was trying to find this. Which I'm guessing the Night Swan thing I'm, is that supposed to be kind of some kind of protean rebel kind of thing, right? Yeah, like, I'm sure like, that was another because you know. they they have one of the things that I really like about Rebels, about Rogue One, about Thrawn is that they have started establishing that there are different factions of rebels that eventually had to come together or yeah. or die and which, that's which is on did by the way in Air to the Empire. Yes. And with I, Garm Bell Iblis. I I like that they're doing that same sort of thing where you've got Saw Gerrera's more extreme rebels and you've got, you know, whatever Night Swan was doing with his people and then you've got the the sort of central rebels that we see in Rogue One. Uh, I, I like the idea that these disparate groups fighting their own battles eventually did have to come together because that was the original idea of the Alliance. It's called the Alliance for a reason. Uh, yes. so I, I like that they're, that they're paying it's attention. Kind of what Rogue One is about. Yeah. Too. And I, I like, of... I like that they're paying attention to the storytelling and that things are coming together, uh, to, to what you said about this basically being a documentation of what happened rather than a, a, a lot of action, I I like that it, there's so much synergy, and people hate the word synergy, but synergy is a nice thing when you've got such a huge palette of different mediums. Yes. No, I enjoyed that too. It's, yeah. it's very rewarding. Uh, the only I, things, I, I enjoyed the synergy. The only things that uh, we didn't hit on that I wanted to mention is, one, I really loved the use of the uh, V-19 ships because it kind of crosses from Clone Wars to Rebels because uh, the V-19s were kind of the big ships uh, through yeah. through a good portion of the book. Um, yeah. And this is yeah. something, as soon as I saw the name Hasishi, I had to look it up because it, it, it rang in the back of my old decrepit brain. Uh right. This is the Tagorians' first appearance in the new canon. Uh, Tagorian yep. are like cat-based people that Timothy Zahn yeah. created. And Hasishi yep. was Card's, Talon Card's bodyguard in the old canon. 
Oh, well, okay. I knew the name struck a bell. I mean, right. I knew the Targaryen. But right. I didn't know and the, it, and yeah. It, yeah, I didn't cool. bother to look it up, but I, it, it I had to. sound familiar. I had to. It was driving me crazy. because I we, found that plot. To, I found that plot twist, like that whole thing, to be very contrived, though. The whole, like, maybe we should check the bodyguard schools. Like, I yeah. was like, what? what it, that felt weird to me. Like, there were a couple moments like that where we talk about how he sometimes he sap- supernaturally solves problems. Um, there were times where they were leaps in logic that could only be created by the writer. Well, <laughs> and, and that one, I was and, actually and, more and, disappointed. It wasn't a more consistent. Like, I wanted more out of that story. Yeah. Uh, it did feel too neat and clean. Like, I, I it was thought. Simply there to have them cross paths. Yeah, and I thought there would be a little more to that than there wasn't. But, but yeah. it was another aspect of here are things that people are doing to rebel. Yeah, no, they are, and, and, it, and yeah, I didn't mind that. It was, it was the there were there were, and I don't have them, you know, laid out in front of me. That there were a handful of leaps that Thrawn makes that are beyond supernatural. Right, like they you kind of have to just it, go with it. In a way, they don't make any sense. Right, and and or 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 they are so hinged on coincidence. I mean, what was always great, and we talk about this, what was always great about his character, and, and the thing that always intrigued me most about him was the obsession with art and his his belief that, you know, by uh, observing a species' art, he could tell how they fight. Which it's, has... It's been, that's in the first chapter of Heir to the Empire. Well, right? but that's it, the has, very first chapter it has carried over, and I'm glad that it has. No, it has. Because it was the first, it one of the first thing, and well, one of the first three episodes, I can't remember which one, that he appears in Rebels, they make a, a big point. Well, the whole episode where he goes to Hera's home where he goes to Ryloth yes. is about that. No, they have totally carried that on. What and, and they love did in this novel though is gave him like Sherlock Holmesian abilities to deduce things out of thin air in a way or or, or with very scant evidence that, that at times just strained credulity where I just felt okay I guess I guess that you're I mean that can only be a guess but of course it's going to be right because you're Thrawn and so um, <laughs> there were a few moments like that that kind of bothered me where he's just trying to show how smart he was I, I like this idea that he you know I almost wish they'd lean more he'd lean more into the art and culture aspect because um you know, uh, I, I just saw the new Fast and the Furious, and one thing that's great about those movies is they found a way to express everything through car. Car is everything. <laughs> everything is car. So, like, you can tell in that mo- in those movies, you can tell like you know people fall in love by how they drive. They can tell whether someone's a good guy or a bad guy based on how they drive. Um, everything is expressed just through car. It's actually kind of brilliant in its in its own dumbass of, axe body spray away. Of but, all the things that I expected us to hit on in this yeah. podcast. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is but like so Thrawn's thing was always everything's expressed through art. You know, is is you can tell everything you need to know about a, a, a people by their art. Sure. And um and yeah, they still hit that, but then there was a couple moments where it reminded me of Tom Hanks and the Da Vinci Code where it's like yeah, 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 you, yeah. Know, you know, it's like this, this, this must be this. Right. Da Vinci you know, and and uh, and then it, in those moments, kind of lost me where he was. You know, there's a reason writing a character like that is difficult because, and and why you have to have a character like Eli because you can't always be in Thrawn's brain because Timothy Zahn is not as smart as smart as Thrawn is right, supposed exactly. to be. Right, exactly. So you have to have a character on the outside so that the character that is the brilliant one can have his own internal monologue and his machinations and in his motivations hidden from you part one because that's more mysterious and two because the writer isn't gonna <laughs> isn't as smart as this guy right right he's you know? not as smart it's, as this super intellectual character it's very difficult to do so but it, it, well, it was what? it was it was good and i'm looking forward to seeing more i'm definitely looking forward to season four of rebels and see where they take him What's funny about that, that you bring that up, is I was re-reading through my 20th anniversary edition of Heir to the Empire, um, and it's got pages and pages and pages of footnotes. And one of the first footnotes in the first chapter when he's talking about art is that Timothy Zahn had no reason or rhyme behind putting that in there. He just thought it would be cool if Thrawn was into art and, and he didn't mean it to mean anything deeper, but obviously it 
became something deeper. Well, and what's funny and, is it turned out to be such a brilliant narrative device because by saying Thrawn looks at this art and understands this, it's, it explains away a lot of his deductive process without having to explain it. And it probably is nonsense. Oh, sure. But, Absolutely. You know, that's the best. Like, yeah. reasonable nonsense is one of the greatest narrative tools ever. Yeah, no. I mean, they, they found a, I mean, you know, they've, he did a good job of, uh, you know, I said it must be a challenge to take this character and, and fit, trying to keep as much of what you created intact while jimming it into somebody else's story and narrative yeah. and timeline, you know, and, and I think he did a good job of that. I just think that there was maybe room for a little more of a, a little more of a novel, um, a little more of an adventurous novel, other, not just two dueling origin stories, which is really what it is, is it's just two origin stories. And like I said, before we start recording, it's just, the, it's, it's very great Gatsby in the way it's structured and, and how the title character is not the lead character. And we learn everything about the title character through a, to, through his effect on others. Well, this uh, this won't surprise our listeners, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Beth, That's Beth fine. Uh, what are your final thoughts there? Uh, overall, I really, really liked it. I went in not knowing anything about it other than it was going to be a Thrawn book, so I was sold. I did not realize it was going to be basically a Rebels prequel, but that totally did not bother me. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I I enjoy. I went in, and I, as I go into most things now, I try to to either manage my expectations or not have expectations. Uh, I I've even given up on kind of like trying to prognosticate future plot lines and things that I care about because it's just easier to not be disappointed that way. But I went in not knowing really even what what this would be about. Uh, like you said, other than it's about Thrawn, and uh, I enjoyed it. There were a couple little things here and there. Where where I was like, well, this went on for a minute too long, or I would have liked a little more depth here. But as far as it being a catalog of of Thrawn's achievements and an explanation of how this this uh, alien outsider became a Grand Admiral, it satisfied what I wanted. Uh, and and really, we never got this full a version of his story in what is now referred to as Legends. So it, it satisfied me there, too, because as much as his character is slightly different, things happen a little differently, but it doesn't it doesn't conflict with what we know of Thrawn so much that I experienced any kind of, like, cognitive dissonance like I have with some of, of the canon did, stuff. Did it surprise you at all that he name-drops he name drops Anakin Skywalker in it? It is mentioned several times that he had met Anakin Skywalker, yet they never explain it. Well, it did it, surprise me, but it disappointed me. They didn't explain it. I yeah. thought, and, and I, you're, you, I'm so glad you brought that up because we almost wrapped this thing up without mentioning it. Uh, I for sure thought that was going to be like a flashback chapter of the book. And uh, here, here is my guess: is one that book is coming, or two, Maybe. it's going to yeah. be one of those like ebook novellas that they release on StarWars.com or something. Yeah. But I mean, to me, that's a novel for sure. That's got to be a novel. I mean, and, and the thing is, it made me, and we talked, it made me think about outbound, outbound flight, which right. is when Thrawn and Anakin would have encountered each other. I don't remember if they actually met face to face during I that. Encounter. See, I don't feel like they did. I feel like that's I don't a new think they element. Did. Uh, so, that, um, you know, and so I don't think it's a reference to that. I think it's a reference to something else, but it's weird because it's like Palpatine seems to know about it and, you know, and, and it may have been that, you know, cause, you know, you, you find out at the end of the book that he wasn't really outcast. Right, that he was he was basically right. set up there as, as he plans. set it up. Well, and here's what's interesting: we don't have, and and I think this is correct, we do not have anything new canon that predates Phantom Menace at this point. No, no. I mean, um, I as a matter of fact, I still hold I hold the ancient Old Republic stuff still as canon. Sure, for. Sure. My own, you know, because because there's no reason for it not to be until they touch it. But they have not. And, and I, you know, I, this, this wouldn't be that, but I don't think, they haven't even really messed a whole, around a whole lot with prequel era, have they? I mean, aside from Clone Wars, which, which, um, is, I mean, that's. There's some, I mean, there, they, there is a Darth Maul comic right now that takes place before Phantom Menace. 
Um, which I mean, that's minor, but there is a Darth Maul comic that. that oh, is that's doing right. That. I, you know what? I've it just, is, it's in my stack, and I haven't read it. Yeah, yet. It, it is before Phantom Menace. Um, you know, there is a there is a. Uh, and this is I, I I'm disappointed because I wanted to write this book, but there is a YA novel coming out about 16 year old Leia in the Senate, which is oh, a novel that wow. I this is a novel I always wanted to write really bad. Odd that that would be a young adult book though. Is yeah. I'm a yeah, little concerned so many, so about many, this. So many of them are. <laughs> but, you know, some of the young adult books have been good. But the Ahsoka yeah, yeah. was technically a YA novel, and I thought the Ahsoka novel was great. So uh, Yeah, um, you're right, you're right. Some of the, the newer, I mm-hmm. see, whenever you say Star Wars yeah. YA, I think of the older stuff. But you're right, some of the more recent stuff yeah, has been very good. Yeah, the stuff like Claudia Gray and stuff like that yeah, are really yeah. good. And, 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 and so, and, um, but I, I don't think they're, you know, they're looking forward, they're, they're, I mean, Hans, the Han Solo movie is going to be before New Hope, obviously. Right. Um, but going back before that, I don't honestly think they have much interest in. You'll see comics, maybe, and you'll see books, and there's rumors of a Knights of the Old Republic kind of reboot, game wise. Mm. You know, um, uh, of doing a, a reboot of the original uh, Kotor. Sure. But uh, so that would be their first step into that, and and everything, but. You know, there is this sense that that they just want to move forward, and and their their entire as a as a company, Lucasfilm slash Disney slash our overlords, they <laughs> they want you to they they want everything to remind you of the classic films right. that you loved as a kid. Which is That's smart. all they care about. Which is smart economically. It, it, for a Star Wars, hardcore Star Wars fan, it can be less than satisfying narratively, but. All they care about is, well, oh look, it's a, it looks, it's an ad at, oh look, it's a stormtrooper. They want it to feel familiar, um, because the prequels the felt that, so different. Well, the thing is though, they want it to feel familiar to the people that have money, which right now is us. But that's true. Twenty years from now, maybe not even twenty, maybe ten years from now, when the prequel people who grew up with the prequels have money, yes, uh, they will be taking a different look at things. They might, but then we don't know where it'll be at that point. But I, I just think they're, true. they're, it could they're be, so. It, it could be could owned be over. by Sony, and it could be over. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, you know, never forget. I mean, it won't be over. The Marvel movies will collapse one day. There will be a you know, like I know it doesn't feel <laughs> possible, but the Marvel movies are going to hit a critical mass where it's not like they'll stop making comic book movies entirely, but they're going to have to slow. They'll probably there'll be a point where they have to slow the way the hell down. Yeah, they're not going to be able just, to put out three movies a year forever. It's just not going to maintain. And I sure. think, yeah, Star Wars one a year, um, sure. But I, I don't you know. Even want... There's going to be there's going to be a one that there's going to be one that tanks. And by tank, I mean you know it makes five hundred million dollars. But I you know don't, there's going to be one that want... comes on one Star Wars movie a year. I feel like it's too much. I yeah, agree. That's, we're going to get that at least until nine. Right. Yeah. I, I have a I have a fear of Star Wars burnout movie wise. Uh, well, here's my problem with it is not the burnout. My problem with it is what it's done to the toy lines because now, <laughs> rather <laughs> rather than surprise, now yeah. rather than having three years for Hasbro to hit on all of those minor characters, all those all those characters yeah. from Maz's castle, all those characters yeah. uh, from the background of Rogue One. They don't have time to get those out. Now it's now well now uh the Je- last Jedi is coming out. The the Rogue One line is dead. It's time to move on to Last Jedi. Well now yeah. the Han Solo movie's coming out. So Last Jedi gets 6 months of toys and that's it. So they never touch on, you know, yeah. my love of the Star Wars toy line is based on how far reaching it was and it's not that anymore. And that's No, that is, that is true. I mean, we still don't have a General Organa figure, right? Like I mean, well me, I, I like the the six inch um, black series ones, right. and uh, you know I'm waiting for old Leia. I'm waiting for you know still stuff from Force Awakens that never happened. Right, um, and it's crazy you know, that it's that it's not. But you know, and, and, and I'm used now. to that world where you got everybody. You know, the fact that they announced they're going to do a Thrawn is great, but um, that would have happened. <laughs> you know, that should have happened a while. Ago. You know, it just. Right. It's it's it is different, but but I agree with Beth. Like I I, I as someone who lives in Bree Star Wars, I still I do worry about getting burnt out. Um, there are times over the last decades where I've had to take 
a year off of books and comics and stuff to just kind of like let my love of it fill back up um, and, and, and take some time. We don't get that breather anymore yeah. in a way. It's like every Christmas – Here's more Star Wars, <laughs> and um, and that is a wonderful thing. And and you know, eventually we will have a live action television show. Oh, um, for sure. And eventually we will have, you know, and and I know Rebels is ending, and but there's that the new little short films are going to do about all the women characters. Well, and um, they'll do there. There will be something to follow Rebels because Rebels still yeah. makes the money. So there will and be, they would be and they would be real dumb to let Dave Filoni. Oh yeah, go. that's not going to happen um, because he is he is. Producing, honestly, in my opinion, the best Star Wars content out of anybody yeah. is what Dave Filoni has been doing, and 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 he he makes he made the prequels better, yeah, right. by how good Clone Wars was, right? He made the prequels better. I don't even think about Hayden Christensen, who, by the way, had a was at Celebration apparently and had a great time and had a really good sense of humor about himself, which I love to see. But he, but like, I don't think Hayden Christensen. I think. Tom Lantner and the uh, yes. Anakin that I saw on Matt Lantner, sorry, and, and and Anakin that I saw on Clone Wars, like he managed to like redeem that era to a lot of people. Um, and then Rebels is just, despite I liked Force of Weekends, I really liked Rogue One. I still think Rebels is the best Star Wars Star Wars story Star Wars storytelling that's happening right now. Yeah, I would agree, and, and it's a, it's more of a slow burn, but I agree. Yeah. So. I really enjoy it. So, but yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, but yeah, I, like I said I liked it, but I didn't like. I wasn't over the moon, but you know, Beth, I enjoyed it. Beth, do you have a final long ramble? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do not have a final long ramble. I will only say that the fact that you messaged me last week saying that a book was awesome meant that I needed to start reading it immediately, simply because you're not. A, you're not quite the voracious reader that I am. Ooh. So for you to say that Shots a book fired. is awesome. Now, now wait a minute, no, Miss. Not. Wait a minute, <laughs> Miss. I've only read five expanded universe novels. Because I read lots and lots of other books. Slow your roll. No, I I love reading. It's un- unfortunately uh, my company banned reading, which uh, the only time I really have to read is when I'm at work. Uh, they you, North Korea? Korea? What do you mean? I did not say reading. that you Oh, yeah, at work. At work. Okay. Yeah, at right. work. I didn't say like that you don't read. 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 That you don't read. It's just that you never have time to read. Yeah, and, and that is that is a fact. But uh, fortunately, I do things for you to pop up and say, this book is awesome. You have to start you reading read it right now. You guys read Bloodline by Claudia Gray? Yes. Very, very okay. good. Because that one I thought was really good. And then uh, Rogue One Catalyst, definitely worth a read. Um, I agree on both be, of those points. Well, uh, actually, very, very, I, I would go so far as to say those are both essential. If you are a Star Wars fan and you enjoy what is happening in Star what's Wars right now. What's Bloodline, that? Ex- Bloodline explains more about the world of Force Awakens than Force Awakens does yes. by... <laughs> exponentially, right? Well, I mean, and if, makes and if uh, for, for anybody listening that that loves Leia and and or just loves strong female characters, that that is the book for you. Yeah, you get the yeah, Leia it's, it's... that even the old expanded universe, which I thought presented a very cool Princess Leia, even the old expanded universe didn't present her Got in on as strong a way as Bloodlines. Yeah, Bloodlines is a, a fantastic book that I think got got lost. Like not a lot, it, it kind of got lost in the. I don't know. No one ever talked about it. And um, she is the main character. Like it is her. No, it is. It is a. It it's is a Princess a Leia book. Organa. It's not even. It's a, no, it's a General Organa book. Well, yeah, it's yeah. A full you're right. You're right. Not, I guess she's not a general in it yet. But like, it is a. It is a very strong. And and I do say, and the writing style is off-putting. But aftermath, life, dead, and aftermath, Empire's End. If you don't want to read them. Go on Wikipedia, and yes, if you're listening to this, you probably know it exists, but there is a thing called Wikipedia, (laughs) and go on there and read the synopses, because if you want to know how the Empire actually ended in this timeline, because it's only about a year between Endor and Jakku, at least read the synopses of those books, because there's a lot of things that happens, and you will find out the fate of the Rancor Keeper. (laughs) <laughs> and I know that's what everyone has been hanging on, but 
he does these little interstitials in it where he tells you where Jar Jar is, the Rancor Keeper, and in fact, there's actually Boba Fett stuff in it. Is the Rancor Keeper still named Malakili? Oh yeah, no, his name's exactly the same. Okay, no, good, good. No, I was, no, no, well, no. I was right. Writing... The only reason I knew it was the Rancor Keeper is because it says Malakili falls into the sand or whatever was the first line. I, I, I was, was like, hardcore. I was writing uh, <laughs> a post. Well, by the time this by the time this episode goes up, the post will be live because it goes up Wednesday. Uh, I was writing a post about the vintage collection returning next year and which characters uh, we need to be a part of it. And I was looking up some names and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know if these guys are necessarily named this anymore. Because uh, I don't all... think they've stepped on that very much. Um, well, there's no reason I will they say would. this. Malakili is still very sad. Oh, <laughs> um, poor and, guy. Uh, now it takes place right in the aftermath because what, what okay. the book does is it has... It has a main storyline in those movies, in, in the, the, about this. There's a woman, there's a moth or an admiral named Sloan, and she's kind of the villain, and then the hero is this woman named Nora Wexley, who is the mother of Snap Wexley. Oh, okay, um, so she, and she appeared in the comics, I can't remember which ones, yeah, but. Yeah, she's, and she's the mother of Snap Wexley, okay. who's Greg Grunberg's character in Force Awakens, and Snap is in the books too. And so they're the leads, but what it does is it cuts to occasionally it has these little interludes where it just, jumps around the universe. Right, right. And shows you like, this is what Jar Jar's up to. This is what Malachi's up to. You know, and like just yeah. just a little like here characters that we're never gonna touch again. Here's just a little epilogue for each of them. Uh, I, I gotta like that. I gotta like it's, that. Alright, on that note we gotta we gotta wrap this thing up. It's bedtime for yep. everyone. Uh Chad, where can we find you online? Um, Twitter, Chad J. Sh- at Chad J. Shonk, all one word. Um, my website, chadjshonk.com, and um, I'm hoping I buy my book, my science fiction book, Proxy, on Amazon um, for Kindle and paperback, and uh, hopefully movie or television in the next year or two. Yeah, so. that's right. I said we've got to go to bed, but you have to go right. I do have to go right. I'm writing a pilot, so um, I right, to, young I man, to, right. Beth, where can we find you? <laughs> where can we find you online? I Beth? have none of, I have none of those things that Chad has, but you can find me on lead, needlessthingsite.com. dot com. What's the other got, Tuesday? You've got needless Beth, right? Uh, I do have that. I, I don't everybody, use it very often. everybody, go follow at needless Beth on Twitter. And request oh, that she I didn't even stuff. know about that. I didn't even See? know about that. See? And maybe she'll, okay, well, she'll post. If people follow me, I'll post. And <laughs> she'll post about the thousands of books that she reads, apparently. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, you guys. Yeah, thank, you so, go. thank you so much right. for getting this book read and for coming on and doing this, because I just I really wanted to talk about this thing after I finished reading it. Uh, and you were the guys that I wanted to talk about it with, so you thank you so much. Blue, blue skinned aliens, so. Yeah, blue skin yep. aliens. Yep. All right. <laughs> Later, guys. Bye. Thron, 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 thron. I like to think that's what the Imperial March sounds like in the post Return of the Jedi world of the former expanded universe. And you know what I like to think? about the current real universe is that you guys will go to needlessthingsite.com, click on the Amazon link, and buy things, whether it be socks, baseball bats, hats, devil horns, William Regal action figures, bedroom shoes, nutcrackers, venom, the watcher. I'm just looking around the room at this point naming things. TIE fighters, uh, mad balls, Dick Tracy trading cards, whatever. Just go to needlessthingsite.com and click on the Amazon link and buy some stuff. Help us out. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And go to supportphantom.com to get a behind-the-scenes look at uh, everything that goes on with Needless Things and the Needless Things podcast, the exclusive patron cast that I try to get up more than monthly, and just the knowledge that you're supporting a guy who loves doing a thing but who doesn't particularly want to do the thing for free for the hundreds and hundreds of Phantomaniacs out there in the world. So uh, go check that out and see if you feel like you, you, you can chip in a buck a month to help a brother out. 
I would appreciate it. Because, I mean, I'm not going to stop doing this. I'm not going to stop going to conventions and talking on panels. I'm not going to stop the podcast. I'm not going to shut down needless things. So it'd be great if you guys would help out. Because you know what? I love you guys. Thank you for listening to the Needless Things Podcast. You're the best. You can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Downcast, or in the ears of a Trade of Vix employee. And of course, it's at needlessthingssite.com. Love you. Mean it. Uh Uh-huh.